There is an old saying in the Zen tradition, as far as I know. It's from the Zen tradition. It's a bit like a koan, which they work with. And it says, only speak when you can improve the silence. This feels rather an impossible task. So excuse me if I make you quiet for the rest of the meeting today.
as long there is some sense of separation, some sense of a separate me, of a separate person in me. And who can really say that there is none, zero trace of that? I rather, for example, always stay cautious. I never know if there is not some hidden pocket somewhere that I haven't discovered yet that might could still have the power to pretend be a separate individual. So this beautiful proverb on Zen, only speak when you can improve the silence, just came to mind somehow. points to this rather peculiar experience we are all making as a human being. That even though through satsang we know that there is just one reality, just one source, just one consciousness or shared being. We all make the experience that we can speak, feel, perceive, experience we could say from the mind or from the heart. from ignorance or from understanding. Not that we could control that by willpower, like so many have tried, and many traditions may still try. But we can be available. We can... do our best to apply 
the understanding from satsang, from our inner wisdom, Do our best to keep the heart open, so to speak. The heart is a very good indicator, and I don't mean essentially the physical heart, but the spiritual heart, the gate to our depths, to this silence. So it's also a bit the belly and the throat, but the heart is um, the most obvious, the most clear indicator can be. Because the mind has a tendency to trick us, the conditioned mind. To trick us into Believing that it's thinking, feeling, perceiving. From the source, from consciousness. Out of fear, like in the song, it can and it may trick us to fall back into the filtered copy of the original out of fear to let go completely, to surrender completely to the source, to get out of the way. can be very convincing telling us many stories about the truth, about us, about our enlightenment or about our misery. It doesn't really matter so much. But our heart is when we are in doubt, possibly sometimes, is much more trustworthy, so to speak. When we are identified, when we believe out of the old habit to be this separate person limited by and in this body and mind, when we believe 
that this contraction of consciousness is me we will usually find that our heart is contracted, is closed, at least to some degree closed. When we are speaking, feeling, perceiving, acting, from this experiential understanding that we are universal, loving awareness, one shared being, There is, the gates are open, so to speak. There is no need to protect an illusory separate me. So the heart is willingly leaving the doors wide open so the light of consciousness can shine through this spiritual heart into our human experience and express itself in thought, speech, feeling, perceiving, expressing, relating. So when we are in doubt, where we are, so to speak, maybe we are not in doubt anymore who we are or what we are because we have firm understanding on the level of belief. But the body, the feelings, the perception might not quite match this understanding. And we may feel bound to this body and to this mind. When we feel limited, we may react unconsciously, so to speak, with closing this gate, this spiritual heart. When our understanding is really firm and it is really embodied, established in our experience, there is no more reason to close this gate 
this door. And we do know that deeply. So the living experience of embodied understanding is an open hand. And from that open heart, it is much, much more likely that our actions, our speech, will not only improve the silence, the understanding, but also will act in a way that is supportive, that benefits the whole, the totality of any given situation that we find ourselves in with our avatars. It is only the fear of this old habit of a separate me that tends to close the heart to protect its false identity and out of that fear we may find ourselves acting, speaking, feeling out of line with our understanding, with our intuition. How this universal consciousness would act, speak, feel, perceive in this situation. And even though we cannot really manipulate that, there might be a good reason still for this body-mind out of an unintegrated past that in some situation or other will activate this protection mechanism in the avatar. And any force to rip the heart open, so to speak, will just infuse more fear usually and will rather enhance the need to close. But what we can do surely is to notice, especially when we are in doubt, how does my heart feel in this moment 
And the tricky part is the conditioned mind doesn't know. It, it, it doesn't even know what I'm talking about, spiritual heart, what you mean. There's this pumping organ, maybe. What you mean is open, it's closed, it's pumping, hopefully. But we know our being, being intimately close with this gate, in touch with the spiritual heart. And check. So just the very checking, the very looking, the open, interested looking, the stopping maybe for a brief moment where the mind might be very busy and the situation might be so dramatically important and it's like this or that and it has to be now and da 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 if we find just this oh, or we may be in, in dramatic suffering and the mind fires and painful thoughts and all feelings of separation pour out we will find very often if we stop and check that the heart is contracted that it's closed And just the very checking, as I say, is already bringing us back to the other side, so to speak, of the door. And we're tuning already back in. It's almost like a self-inquiry. How is my heart? Oh, because only awareness can check. I go back to myself, to loving awareness. And when the contraction, the fear, or the identity with the separate me in that moment is not too strong, the very checking, the very looking, the interested, open, listening to my heart, so to speak, will often already Allow it to release, relax. And gently open, maybe just a tiny little bit, but that's already enough. And last case is to get back in touch with this loving awareness to get out of the illusion if it took a grip on us emotionally through suffering or mentally through believing that I'm a superhero and whatever anything can whatever is attractive to my conditioning will convince me whatever I want to be, how I want to be. So in very miserable thoughts, but also very positive, very beautiful thoughts can convince me to be speaking, acting, Perceiving from the source.
my dear teacher Ram Das wrote this beautiful book. How can I help? I don't remember so much, but I remember it was about the phenomenon of what we call sometimes the helper syndrome. The conditioned mind can find a very convincing strategy, a very convincing purpose to get away from that fear that is lurking in every human being, this fear of dissolution, the fear of losing control. So this fear which comes then with many accompanied or consequent feelings in one's life that are rather unpleasant to the separate entity, like sadness or frustration, anger, No one really wants to have those. So we tend to move away, look away from those so-called negative feelings. And create an identity, this helper syndrome that is very convinced that it needs to save the world, maybe needs to save everyone, needs to help. And that is, of course, beautiful to help our fellow friends. But the question is, is it coming from this openness, from this understanding, from this deep down knowing that actually it's okay. Essentially it's okay and from there we can go out and, and help in the dream so to speak. But if we believe that the dream is absolutely true and there is just this dream that this consciousness depends on the dream, depends on this body-mind, we will run away from this fear and from those negative feelings because this fear is this belief and this feeling that this dream experience of the avatar, this game, is real. So my body-mind is only there when there is this awareness and not the other way around. When I lose my body-mind, I lose awareness, I lose life. And everyone else around me as well. So we have to save everyone, we have to protect everyone. But it's not coming from freedom, and this is what the book is about. How can I help? Very often... 
and we may know such people and maybe we even find traces of that in ourselves or remember helping becomes a distraction from our own fear, from our own ignorance, from our own negativity. And we impose on everyone and everything around us that there is problems and that we need to solve them. And we may, if we are really deeply identified with that, we may not even ask or notice what the people really need. We just go into situations and, and or to people and just try to help them. And they may even don't even want to help. This is this power of the game, of the illusion that the mind, the conditioned mind can create any convincing strategy. To get away from this fear. And as the mind is a little bit tricky, because it has these convincing stories. Checking the state of our heart, so to speak. Can be of great help to make sure that we don't act, that we don't speak, that we don't even feel out of this contraction, out of this protection, out of this fear, out of this pain, that maybe when we notice that it is the case that the contraction is here, that we have closed ourselves from ourselves, so to speak, that it's maybe sometimes better to stop and to wait until openness comes back. In a way, that's what Ram Das discovered in this book, that simple realization that we may all have at some point, that we really can only help anyone if we help ourselves first. It's like this instruction on the plane when the oxygen masks come out, hopefully we never experience that. But in theory, to first put the mask on ourselves and then <laughs> share with the loved ones around us or help the others around us to really help. We have to make sure that we don't filter in our own sense of lack, our own ignorance, our own needs.
Well, this is kind of, and and probably all of us have experienced that. It's kind of unpleasant if someone wants to force you to help you and you feel somehow, wait a minute, something's not quite right. Is this coming from the right place, so to speak? Can we improve the silence? Can we improve the situation? Can we help this person when we are ourselves still? In some moments, in this moment where the situation occurs, kind of locked in the old habit of a separate me. So it's a little bit of a different form of self-inquiry. You just check in here and then. To stop for a brief moment and to check how is my heart now. And when we're not very accustomed with that checking, it might take a, a few moments or a few minutes to really not to think how my heart is, but to really see, perceive from the source, to see the state of my heart. Am I open? It's a great way, in my experience, to counteract the tricky, conditioned mind, having very convincing stories about where we at, we speak. And when we check and we feel, yeah, I'm open, my understanding is expressing itself. The light of consciousness is shining through, so I can trust my avatar, I can trust my body, my mind, my feelings much more, so I can be of help. Of course, if it's required or if it's my wish in some situations or when we share this understanding that we are deepening all together in all of you at least those that I that I know for a while have such a deep understanding of what you are, understanding and feeling of our shared being. It's very evident in our meetings. So out of that, it's very likely that when we meet friends, when we go to work, this understanding that brings about happiness and alleviates the suffering, it would be strange if we would not 
find some impulse to share that with our loved ones in some way or other maybe not everyone is so foolish and tries to speak about it directly like me it can be in many ways it can be through music or touch and art and our simple workplace or also through words when they are required or when they are appreciated so let's make sure that we share our understanding and our talents our love from an open heart so to speak because we all know also in the spiritual world sometimes some people who got it apparently can be very very insisting somehow and and it's so important suddenly to it ooh, oh it somehow we're like i thought it's uh, all okay why why is this getting so somehow the life can suddenly depend on the perspective of truth that words can share Often from the good intention, because we really wish to help. But if we fall back in the old habit, and it can very easily happen, especially when we start speaking about the truth, that the old habit of a separate me sneaks in if we maybe don't get straight away the confirmation or the recognition or the appreciation of our sharing we might fall back and then we and then we have to catch to catch ourselves if there is a contraction a contraction back into a separate me and then often it's better to pause so for quite a while it seems that we don't really have the power to affect this openness or closeness we can just observe or we can notice we can see where we add and that already as i said often has an has an effect and it's a very soft way of self-inquiry to come back to the openness to the understanding any force any willpower any insisting usually comes from this old habit of a separate me so it's better to step back and to just watch but after a while so to speak when we are really deeply rooted in this understanding We may move beyond just observing, just noticing. And we can apply our freedom in consciousness 
and we have a choice. Then we can not only observe or notice our state of openness where we add, we can consciously, from consciousness, from understanding, not from a separate me, trying very hard to be somehow open, but just from our freedom, from lightness, from understanding, from consciousness, we can choose to apply the understanding and to stay open, to not follow the fear, to not listen to the fear of the separate me. Eventually, we maybe have listened to this record, to this radio program of fear and its accompanied feelings of separation, and we choose to simply come back to openness, to loving awareness, and leave the gate open, because there is nothing to fear. It usually comes when we, this freedom that can be applied, this choice comes when the when the understanding is so rooted, so to speak, that we see that closing ourselves is actually more painful than staying open. The old habit of the contracted me of a separate me that gives to the ego, we want to call it this way, the identity of a separate me, it gave me so long, possibly, security, safety. I found a landing place, a fundament, a, a, a ground on which I can stand as a separate me. So I choose, as long that is my experience, I will choose to make sure that I take care of the separate me first. So I, whenever something comes that I don't like or that feels to be fearful or that reminds me of situations that were actually dangerous in my life, of course, I close. And to the ego, it feels good. It's like, yeah, oh, safe. But with growing understanding, with this living understanding from experience, eventually it kind of, there is a subtle switch in our experience where the closing, the return to a separate me, the separation is actually more painful than staying open, open to the fear, open to the pain, open to anything in the phenomenal world that is 
apparently unpleasant to the avatar, the price becomes too high, so to speak, to close. And when that realization somehow dawns in us, that the price for closing is too high, the price for re-identifying is too high, because the closing is more painful than feeling actually the energy of pain, the thought, the feeling of pain. All we want eventually is just to live the understanding to be what we are and to live that because we found the peace the happiness the love that we were seeking for in that so we know closing is not an option and then there is a choice and then, so to speak, it sounds like a timeline, of course it isn't. This moment, I'm noticing, oh, there is the old habit. And then I can not only observe, but I can, because the pathway to myself is so established, I just go back to myself, to consciousness, to loving awareness. And there is this deep knowing that there is nothing to fear and I choose to stay open or to reopen. The identification with the separate me has thinned out, so to speak. The ignorance has been uprooted. And the understanding has been embodied. That this switch from the helpless, choiceless, separate me that never had a choice. It was always just pretending to be in charge. If it would have a choice, it would have chosen all its life just pleasure and nice experiences and beautiful people and eventually we realize that this is the illusion. So there is no freedom of choice in this identified, separate, closed, separate me. But in consciousness, there is freedom. Freedom to stay open and freedom to stay in that which is real, in that which is eternal, in that which is infinite, in that that cannot be harmed, in that that has nothing to fear, nothing to win, nothing to lose. It is whole and complete. We are whole and complete by ourselves. This understanding allows us to stay open as consciousness and the body and the mind that needed to be protected, the belief, the thought, the position, 
the point of view, even about spirituality, non-duality, this is right, no, it's like this, it's like that, la, la, la. All of that can be given up freely and not knowing and just being because I am. So I may lose the fight, I may lose the discussion, I may even with intelligence, of course, as the guardian of my body, but I may even allow my mind to be in a situation that feels not great out of love, and I, and I take in some energy or The priority in this embodying process, in this making the understanding our own, living it, the priority shifts. Usually from the needs of my body, of my mind, to this open spaciousness, consciousness, which expresses in the avatar not in the physical structure but in the energetic structure in the subtle body through this open heart through this open gate and we dive into the world from this understanding, from this openness, from this knowing that there is nothing to lose. So in a way this openness of the heart is like a, apparently Ramana Maharshi said, I don't know, Ekatole says that always, I never found that quote and I, and I read a bit of Ramana and I love him very much, but it's often said, very often the, the degree of our understanding of our embodied understanding or whatever we want to call it, of our freedom is is dependent on the amount of thoughts that are still going in the mind. I don't know. And I even doubt that Ramana really said that. Well, we can have a lot of beautiful thoughts that are coming from the source because we're just so happy. It's very possible that the mind is just expressing so much happiness and writing one poem after another and writing another song and painting and it's just so happy that it doesn't know what to do with this happiness so it's active if this is an indicator for i don't know not so much for me but this openness of the heart if i walk as consciousness with this avatar through life, through the world, and I and I find myself more and more in this openness that I that I really feel that 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 there is really nothing to protect. That that I can just stay open and loving and 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 give in the other cheek, so to speak, and still be happy or be stupid or wrong. So what? Then I win, so to speak. The game only, of course. Not only in the game. What do I win? Your happiness. Or 
openness is happiness, so to speak, at that point. Where the old protective mechanisms of the separate me were just giving like a false sense of security. Stability. Now this openness reveals actually the true happiness. And always when we are actually truly happy, when there's joy, when there is happiness, when there is gratitude, when there is awe, like Leslie expressed last week, then we'll find guaranteed that this gate is open. It's our nature. To be open. Well, you may want to try next week to play a bit with it and check in here and then. How's my heart? Just a simple question. It's like, who am I? How's my heart? Oh. And it's in a playful way, not in a now we have a new practice, a new task, like a like a little kid, just in a playful way. It's like, okay, is it a little open? Is it a little close? Is it very open? Is it bursting wide open, or is it peeping through a little bit? Because just just checking, just checking. Don't. And not only that it feels great to the avatar to be open. It's also a very simple and very, very effective way 
to embody the non-dual understanding. In daily life, when the gates are open, the light can shine through and it enlightens, it brings this light of wisdom, of understanding, it shines upon our human experience and the intelligence of our consciousness brings us into situations that may reveal some remnants, some knots of separation and we are available with this open heart and, and the understanding finds its way into our life, into our thoughts, into our feelings, into our relationships, into our work. Oh, it's a very practical non-practice of checking in where we at. I think um, Richard sent me a question by email. Seeing, yes. About death. It's clear that most fears are actually rooted in the fear of death, not existing or not being. Reflecting upon this, I have to wonder about other living biological forms. Granted, they probably don't possess the same fabricated sense of identity that we do, but they seem to also, in some sense, have an inherent opposition toward death or not surviving. An animal, plant, or organism does everything it can to survive, to be. If this evokes something, I'd be interested in your comments. Much appreciation. Thank you, Richard. An animal, plant, or organism does everything it can to survive. Yes. To be. No.
I would distinguish here between the instinct to survive and the wish to be. The survival instinct is hardwired into the avatar, into the game, into the human avatar, into the animal avatar, certainly. But I would say the difference to the human avatar, avatar and the dog avatar and the flower avatar and the microbe avatar and the stone avatar, possibly, somehow they're all they're all much more intelligent than we human beings, we could say. They're playing a different game. So we don't feel too stupid, maybe. They just know as we do know in reality that we always are. That being is our nature, our shared being nature, the stone, the microbe, the dog, the human, the plant. They're all we're all sharing this being. This consciousness. The difference, I would say, is we are playing the game of forgetting much more convincingly with us. We can convince ourselves that we don't know that we are, that we are in reality. Free. The animal and the plant and the mineral, most likely, don't have that sense of separate identity, that ego identity. So they're naturally resting in being. And um, when we have a resting dog next to us or a resting cat, that's what we feel why animals are so beautiful also to have them around because they don't have this separate identity, this separate psychological identity thought based on a separate me. So they're just loving, they're just resting in being and then just, just pouring out love and, and we love it to be, to be with them. So they don't have the psychology of a separate me, but they have the physiology of a separate me. Their body is programmed the animal body is programmed in a way to sustain itself. It's the game plan. And in a way, it's the strongest program in the animal. So usually animals, very often they have more fear actually of survival than even the human being. 
it's their main their main instinct so to speak the love is pouring out by itself from the from the beingness so it's it looks like a contradiction maybe but the being because it's never lost so they don't they don't fear to be then they're kind of deeply rooted in being naturally but that doesn't stop them from having their program in the game given which makes sure that they do what is available to them to protect their body we have that too as a human being and that's also what to some degree remains even when we're free from the psychological idea of a separate me it is said that the body being the temple that consciousness has chosen this avatar out of its freedom it will usually choose to run when a tiger comes and that and that often is like in this spiritual fantasy it's like ah oh, you will just sit there and and you will smile at the tiger and it will smile back and then you start cuddling maybe okay that sounds all very beautiful but the problem often is the tiger does know it has also this strong instinct it's programmed so if it's hungry then i don't know if i would risk it so there are these natural built-in programs that belong to the game to the avatars so we might run and the tiger might chase us And practically, if we don't look into some spiritual fantasy, practice practically, also my experience is that the psychological fear leaves. But if we are really in danger, we will do everything to protect. This is this is our I, I've been blessed twice getting very 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 sick after i understood so to speak who I am, what I am. And actually, almost instantly after this became very, very clear to me, in my case, through some stronger shifts, we could say, that just remained in some deeper that some deeper understanding then somehow prevailed in my experience. Very shortly after, I got typhus and fe fever in, in India. Very high fever, Christmas, I remember, no phone reception in Tiruvannamalai. Boom. Scary really scary at that time and I not only experienced a lot of fear and, and surely there was some traces of psychological fear some some trace of, of me and in, in, in that also 
but also simply this physiological experience of really struggling and apparently back then disconnecting from I thought I lost God so to speak I, I found it I lost it this intense state of fear and this very high fever and the weakness of the body made me lose the volume up what I always call made me lose the, 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 the presence there was just this body trying to survive and I didn't get the memo back then but somehow I made it through and a few years later again in India of course always in India somehow it happens I got super high fever and this time it's also not even that typhus no one known what's going on I fainted and in, in a Dayananda ashram I, um, I was kind of bleeding all over and found myself uh, in hospital but this time I got the memo this time I saw that this loving awareness, this shared being that we are, deeply cares about this body. And it's not, and that's what I'm sharing with all of you, it's a not all about this presence and always feeling the shanti and always getting the the volume up, the reflection even, it's most beautiful to have that purity of mind and body to, to or in our satsang, to bask in this, in this light of consciousness. We are already, the being is untouched, it's there. So the being doesn't need to feel to be, so to speak, it just knows. And when the body is really in trouble, like it was then again, and thank God I got the memo, because then hopefully... Um, have to experience such a such a deep state of of sickness or disease again. You never know, but for now at least, I could see that this loving awareness will do everything to sustain this body. And in a way, it was for me an exit of Advaita Vedanta. This idea that it's all about moksha and and just to leave also this. Um, dream existence this body experience because i could i experienced myself directly how much this loving awareness cares about the sustaining of this body about this survival it loves this body it has created this body so it did everything to bring healing to this body and somehow with this realization the body recovered very fast. Still, no one knows what, what happens, actually. So, why I'm sharing this story, it seems to be something that is just built in the game, this survival mechanism. At least the physiological one. And in animals, we see that much more. In plants and minerals, it's hard to observe what's really going on. In them, it's just easy to share and feel the shared being with them. So there seems to be no fear in them, at least in my experience. But yes, those human and animal avatars, they have to some degree this survival instinct. And that somehow, unless we are an avatar maybe and overcome even that, I'm, I'm not dismissing the possibility. It's just not my experience, so I cannot speak from that. But the psychological fear that is so unique to the human experience, this we can overcome and embodied understanding 
living understanding. And we become, as it is described in this box, always no, fearless. We are fearless and we don't run anymore from paper tigers that are just in our mind. So we don't fear an illusory situation, an illusory um, danger that we have to protect ourselves from by closing this heart, as we spoke about today. We can stay open and we, we, we are fearless. But when a real danger comes, which is very rare in our human experience, hopefully, then we might still run like the dog or the any other animal. And this is what we are interested in, because this existential fear or this existential instinct of survival seems to be natural and welcomed. But the psychological fear that is what causing troubles to our human experience. Those paper tigers can be quite threatening. You know, I, I, I love, for example, the autobiography of a yogi. It was like my first, um, it was like my lonely planet on my first trip to India. All these great stories and places. And oh, and India is very good where they love to still. Amazing. It's all about these miracles, all these amazing. The human somehow just loves this, this kind of thing. So... I love this book. It's it's so beautiful. But they tend, these books tend to also about the saints and the sages and they, you know, they're all dead so no one knows anymore and they were always just Buddhas and they never, you know, they never got angry and they were always just sweet and shanti and soft and and that's the only, that's, and then we try to mimic that, no? and try to be like that and think this is the only way freedom looks like in my experience very good to eventually to to forget all of that and just to stick to our actual experience and to see how this living understanding expresses itself in our lives and we see that things might be a bit different and it seems that there is a natural order built in into the game, into the dream. There is this complexity and, and, and like this existential instinct of survival is one of them. And there is nothing wrong with it. It's just a beautiful thing to, that makes us take care of our bodies and makes the animal take care of its body. And one last thing that comes to mind was the animal that I find that I observe quite a bit. We have a tendency, like this How Can I Help book from Ram Das. we have a tendency not only with other human beings, we also have a tendency often with animals to impose our psychological suffering on the animals around us 
clearly animals suffer from pain when they have a, you know some open wound or they had a fight or something of course but they are so if we let them be and india is a good example for that again where we have lots of those also on the street and you observe yes we can have compassion and we can maybe stay with them or even if it's possible still to cuddle them or something but usually we can observe that animals without this psychological me they surrender totally to their state of body and mind and they just you know for, it takes them maybe a day or two or three they give in completely they they may have physical pain but they are so one with it. They are not thinking about themselves, what will happen, and la la la. And they're just accepting it as it is. And very often it finds its place. And they're actually not suffering in the sense that we do. They just experience tremendous pain, maybe, but they don't have this psychological suffering. And in a way, this is also possible for us. We can have tremendous pain without tremendous suffering so maybe it's good we check in sometimes that we don't superimpose our psychological ideas our suffering our ideas on the animal world on the plant world on the mineral world that we are a bit maybe cautious about that and, and just see maybe oh wait a minute if they don't have this psychological me then they're maybe just surrender to the moment as it is even it's maybe very painful and very often they overcome those then also much faster without this psychological me getting in the way So the instinct for survival, the instinct for food, the need to go to the bathroom. You see all these unsaintly things. Sexual desire. Oh my God, no, that's bad so bad this is so not spiritual you should be by now a natural celibate it's just the nature of consciousness well maybe and for some time that that might be true and and was also my experience but then maybe things change again and 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 life takes another course and freedom and consciousness says oh maybe I'm not a monk. Maybe I actually enjoy to have a partner. And when I love someone intimately, then maybe consciousness wants to manifest also in intimacy, love making. It's all part of the game. Can be out of freedom and others may stay forever celibate and enjoy that but all the ideas how it should look like yeah let's let's be careful with those i would say <laughs> 